evening ladies and gentlemen and a very warm welcome to AWS presents Financial Services Symposium. Pleasure to invite Kiran Jagannath. Welcome to the 2024 Financial Services Symposium. My name is Kiran Jagannath and I lead the financial services business for AWS in India. As we explore today's themes, I want to highlight you know, AWS India's mission to enable build a better India. And this isn't just a slogan for us. We truly look at this as a driving force for innovation and hopefully this is visible for you when our teams come and work with you every single day. I'm not going to start with a logo slide. I usually used to do that every year. Because if you just look around, you can see the breadth of engagements AWS has across financial services. But what I want to share is one update, which is I can confidently stand on the stage today and say that 10 out of top 10 private sector banks are building on AWS. And that's been a significant milestone for us that we are very proud of. And over the last 12 months, We've also been onboarding public sector banks, leverage AWS to drive their innovations on AWS. So we've truly come to a point where cloud is being ubiquitous and solving for many problems across themes that I will share about in just a minute. But like every year, I'm going to start this year as well, sharing some broad themes in the industry just to set the context for what we're going to talk about for the rest of the evening. In banking, we expect the banking sector's asset book to close at $7 uh, trillion, with MSMEs expecting to contribute 50% of the country's uh, GDP and 60% of its exports. In the same time frame, the fintech industry is expected to reach $20 billion. It will be interesting to see what happens with credit on UPI, but as you can see on the slide, the expectations are sky high. Please welcome to the stage. Head of India Marketing at AWS, Karthik Saturagiri. At Amazon, we look at Mumbai very, very closely. We do our summits here. Uh, the FSI Symposium is our largest event, and uh, there is a reason we do it here, because we all want to be with you. Uh, so we have a great agenda lined up throughout the day, uh, but I wanted to kind of give you a glimpse of it, uh, because one, we are getting the best of our customers together. Uh, two, we want to bring the best of AWS in front of you. Uh, today, we are going through a remarkable digital transformation uh, in financial services. Uh, I was just researching the stats. Uh, I think between all of us in this room today, we process close to $2 trillion in digital transactions. Think about it, $2 trillion, and it's growing at 50% year over year. Uh, so I think we all need to give us a round of applause to each other. Uh, this room is a trillion dollar economy, and uh, it's growing at 50%. Uh, I don't think uh, many unicorns uh, will grow at 50% at a trillion dollar scale. Uh, so this is possible only through the innovation, uh, through the ideas in this room, and we wanted to put the best of AWS and put of our the best of our customers in front of you. Uh, we also wanted to present a vision for what tomorrow will look like, right? And uh, Gen AI is one major component to it, uh, but we also wanted to remind you uh, what frugal architecture is, uh, what modernization is, uh, what the best of open source is, and we will touch a lot of that during this event through conversations. Uh, but this event is all about you. Thank you and welcome to AWS FSI Symposium 2024 again. Please welcome to the stage, Head of FSI Solution Architect, AWS India, Ramakrishnan K. What are the trends that we are seeing in the FSI market. What is it that FSIs are building on AWS? If you look at what they are building on AWS, they're kind of over-indexing on customer experiences, right? A good number of FSIs are doing phenomenally new things when it comes to the way they are kind of building for their customers, whether it is uh, new age mobile banking or net banking or origination systems, right? They're not, not just stopping there. They're also going and building completely new channels, right? The kind of build the K video KYC, which I think is probably one of the unique things which is available only in India, 
right? And then the WhatsApp banking, and they kind of got on to building more and more things around it. We also see a good number of customers who are relooking at their core. It's not that they are ripping and replacing the core, but they are trying to fortify the core, the core, doing a bunch of things which is probably say around the core, maybe changing the core a bit and say. And this is not just limited to banking, right? We are seeing that across banking, we are seeing that across lending, we are seeing that across broking, right? Well, banks may not yet be moving their core banking onto the cloud, but we see that across broking, we see that across uh, insurance customers and lending for sure. In all this, there is also a silent army, which is kind of building stuff's completely cloud native. Right? And by doing that, the differential experience that they're being able to provide to their end customer is very, very unique. And we see that across about three odd areas, right? We see that across wealth management, right? We also see that across open banking and marketplaces. Fundamental to this is data. And data is, uh, is something that a good number of our customers have built over a period of time on AWS, and they've slowly started kind of gaining additional insights out of it by running AI, and in these days, also doing a little bit of Gen AI on that. Let me kind of pause there, and whatever I told you, also have a customer who comes and talks about their experience of doing modernization, transformation, innovation in a way that they did in their organization. And I would like to invite Vaitishwaran from CRED, who is the head for their cloud infra and site library engineering. So about CRED, it's a members-only app. It's for the trusted and creditworthy users in India, typically about with credit score of 750 plus. And we have quite a lot of products that we sell to this customer base. So we have multiple lines of businesses. Uh, so all of these lines of businesses have their own PNL. So how do we attribute cost to the, each of the line of business and how do they calculate the PNL? This we achieved using cost categories. We have about 95% accuracy of how we attribute cost to these LOBs. And we also use Trusted Advisor and our good friends at AWS who come us and perform well-architected review uh, on our infrastructure. We'll talk about Graviton a bit. This was something that was launched quite some time back, and uh, we were very excited about this because I think it, it's a very interesting uh, innovation if you see. This, this inherently brings down the cost by not doing much. Uh, we, we basically had to quickly move all of our managed services like RDS, Elastic Cache, OpenSearch to ARM-based processors, Graviton, and this was like uh, just a couple of switches, a couple of clicks away, and we could move every other, every managed services that were there on AWS to Graviton-based service. And this immediately brought on the cost by about 40%. And we also try to uh, move our custom applications that we have built, including the payments platform, personalization platform, et cetera, to Graviton to reduce the cost of uh, compute. And currently, we are trending at about 50% of our compute that runs on AWS Graviton. And I will quickly talk about what are the uh, performance metrics like on Graviton. Uh, we have our payments application, which runs on completely on Graviton, and personalization application, which runs on Graviton. And we've seen significant improvement in performance, along with the cost improvements that we've seen uh, by running applications on Graviton. These are typical applications which run on Java and very common frameworks there. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Kane with a huge round of applause. I'm John Kane, and I lead the market development efforts worldwide for financial services at AWS. And what that means is myself and my teams have the pleasure of working with our customers globally, very much from a financial services perspective, helping our customers achieve their business needs by leveraging AWS technology. That means that I have a unique view globally of what our customers are doing in a financial services perspective, and that's what I'm hoping to share with you this evening. When we did the financial services symposium agenda globally, we focused on reinventing what it means to be intelligence in the new age. And a lot of that was driven by what I think has been top of mind for almost all of us over the last 18 months, is how generative AI will affect the financial services industry. Even if generative AI technology doesn't get much better than it is today, we're already seeing the impact in production with those tasks 
that we do today from a financial services perspective that are actually a little bit repetitive and use incredibly large sets of data, but things that we couldn't do until generative AI came on the floor. Already, we have customers, and I'll take my kind of North American view, like Ally Bank, or Principal Financial, the asset manager in the US, use generative AI on conversations with call center agents, immediately doing call center summaries automatically. Now, not only does that save time from an efficiency perspective, but more importantly, that generative AI can then take those notes and look across all those conversations to summarize why your customers are calling you. What are the problems they have? It gives you the opportunity to change the experience for them so you can connect with them before they need to connect with you. And when they do call, you're in a much better position to help their needs. Generative AI has already begun to make an impact in financial services. And with the pace of advancement, both from a compute and from a software perspective, we expect this to accelerate. We are privileged to have with us Mr. Seva Ram Kauta. By way of introduction, Zeta is a banking, uh, next-gen banking technology company. Our founders, Bhavintu Rakia and Ramki Gadi Party, uh, started with the intent of replacing the age-old legacy technology that banks use today. What exactly do we do? We are cloud-native by design. You know, when we speak about cloud, all of us expect there should be a very high scalability. And yes, we are extremely scalable. We have built our entire architecture and stack on a cloud-native paradigm. And if you anticipate and expect infinite scalability, you will get it. Everything about what we offer, transaction processing, account processing, et cetera, run on massively scalable systems and on very high availability. We also expect banking technology should be very secure. And we fundamentally believe that the kind of options that cloud presents is way more secure compared to the other alternatives that are available today. You know, we have built our entire stack with security first principles. We built in zero trust architecture into our stack. We work with multiple lines of defense by design. And we have natively designed the data confidentiality, privacy, and confidentiality for the entire stack that we offer. We have applied zero trust architecture principles at scale globally. Uh, we processed about 3 billion tokens thus far. You know, every day, we have more than 190 million authorized auth tokens that we issue out to various customers that we work with, uh, 8.5 million digital certificates that we issue every day, and so on. So our stack, what does it do? We fundamentally power a range of core banking solutions, be it in credit, uh, loans, or even CASA. Put your hands together for Girish Nayar, Sandeep Haridwaj, Sundaram, and Ajay Ramesh Lande. Let's give them all a round of applause. Sundar, if you look ahead at some of the emerging trends in the financial services space, what role do you think AWS is going to play in shaping some of these emerging technologies, whether you talk about blockchain, uh, the Reserve Bank of India, uh, you know, uh, deploying the central bank digital currency with the stocks of open banking and so on? Just your quick thoughts on that. First and foremost is that the sachet size of products is dropping, right? And that's going to fuel volumes which are just going to go through the roof. And that's going to happen a lot faster than customer revenues are going to go up. So if I was in the capital markets, for example, the way EPFO monies can now be used in the capital markets, it's, and the fact that we are going to second, third tier, fourth tier towns, et cetera, and uh, you know, a lot of these products are getting sold there. Of course, it's a different market that they're not making money, some of those kids there, there's a lot of concern around that. But that apart, that's just going to you know, require a fundamentally different thinking in terms of how do you start working from a tran per transaction cost and work down from there. See, so far what's happened is people have been used to the idea of, in my industry, IT should be X percentage of revenue, the IT cost. 
while that thinking was fine when we were in a world which was le less uh, you know prone to change in the older world whereas in cloud and especially with the way digitization is progressing we've got to have a slightly different thinking so one of the things that we are doing in aws is helping customers understand this change that while you may still continue to calculate it tco which are the transactions that really matter is it your cost per order is it cost per settlement is it cost per fraud is it cost per claim and how do we consider how do we help you set a target there and then consistently keep helping you pull that down because what none of us here can control is the volumes because with every new sub segment we get into etc the volumes are going to keep increasing so we can't throttle volumes but what we can work on is the unit cost and the unit economics uh, phrase which sandeep used which i really liked uh, in when we were speaking outside that's really going to help customers get their hands around how do we even benchmark our costs and how do we keep consistently lowering them so that is one area the second is the art of the possible so today we are talking to our experts globally we are talking to our experts in asia pack we are talking to some of our uh, you know academics here in india in terms of what's the art of the possible for the industry and how do we bring that to our customers to fuel their thinking their innovation and to do that we don't just bring these ideas in amazon we have this concept of working backwards which is a very unique amazon style of taking concepts from prototype to i mean from concept to prototype in the shortest possible time it's a much longer discussion than i can have in a shorter conversation so for those of you interested please do contact your nearest amazon rep but that is a, a mechanism by which we help customers take these ideas to fruition in the shortest possible time so a combination of the tech we are bringing the unit cost economic model that we are thinking and the digital innovation approaches like working backwards that we are bringing that we expect will help our customers truly maximize the value they are getting from cloud all right uh, you know girish we can't really talk about uh, future technologies emerging technologies without talking about generative ai but tell us for insurance uh, as a sector what are the real world use cases what kind of efficiencies is it bringing in or do you think it's still sort of in the hype phase obviously there's a lot of talk and hype about uh, gen ai but uh, having said that uh, there are a lot of use cases that we have put into production and uh, this many of them are not uh, really customer facing because uh, we don't think right now uh, it's mature enough to put it directly customer facing for uh, this but uh, at the back end there are a lot of uh, places that we are using it for uh, generating efficiency uh, couple of examples i one i mentioned on the call center bit where we are using it to uh, summarize calls uh, yeah. the uh, health claims processing there's a lot of uh, data that we get in terms of uh, the, the discharge summaries and the uh, bills that uh, the hospital send us uh, so genia helps us to kind of uh, summarize what is there in that bill compare it to the standard treatment guidelines and then see if the bills uh, the uh, billing is in line with the standard treatment guidelines and create this whole thing uh, in a jiffy for the uh, uh, doctor to adjudicate on the claim this kind of solves for uh, pre processing a lot of stuff with the doctor otherwise used to take uh, uh, say 10 minutes for per claim that gets uh, pre processed and brought up to the doctor uh, and if everything is uh, green he just uh, marks it for for the uh, processing so that's uh, one of the use cases uh, in terms of uh, the back end in terms of um, development uh, developers are uh, making good use of this and i mentioned a modernization program a lot of it in the last year has been uh, sped up using uh, gen ai copilots uh, for transforming old code to yeah. new code i mean that's supremely efficient out there i mean some of the tasks we wouldn't have undertaken uh, yeah. in terms of uh, transforming very very like i mean applications written 15 years ago which are really the core of your system but you don't really want to touch that code because <laughs> you really don't know what is there uh, moving around a new platform almost 70% of the work can be done by gen ai and then you kind of uh, the developers and work on top of it uh, great amount of efficiency in that uh, sort of use case sure. and uh, i think one innovative place where we are using gen ai is marketing 
Okay. Uh, we've uh, already, I mean, uh, last year we had our first uh, marketing campaign entirely generated by uh, Gen AI. We, our marketing team uses Gen AI a lot for uh, creating uh, creatives and uh, film suits. So, you find use cases in all sorts of spheres, uh, not necessarily just the insurance part, but uh, develop, development and uh, marketing as well. Sure. Uh, Sandeep, quick thoughts. We're running out of time. What are some of the few emerging technologies you are most excited about for your industry? Uh, Gen AI, I think all of us have already spoken about that Gen AI itself has uh, you know, a lot of potential. We have not yet uh, scratched uh, the surface, you know, but, uh, and from uh, processing to, uh, uh, rather I would say from discovery, from decision making to optimization, to uh, backend data, to customer service, I think that enough can be done. Like for example, lead lead generation in marketing itself has uh, uh, so much of potential. So it's all about how you personalize the entire experience from a customer, uh, from a lead till closer, from uh, from uh, uh, ideation to execution. So that that. Uh, generative AI has the potential it's to fulfill. It's all pervasive. Yeah. Ajay, final word. Generative AI, uh, as it defines itself, what we are deploying for is for credit underwriting models where it is able to generate CAMs, certain amount of document scrutiny which it is able to do. These are the in-banking use cases. What we look forward to coming from this technology as it is a very promising paradigm, what we look forward to and people have said this in the past also is what we want Gen AI to do is not do my work, but to do those course which I don't like doing. As a person, people are in wanting to do innovative work themselves. So what we want Gen AI to do is probably and since AWS is also a hyperscaler, Gen AI should work in the space of auto-correcting infrastructure, auto-scaling infrastructure, where that housekeeping work which a technology professional, as a banker, I spoke as a banker, there are a lot of use cases where Gen AI can be helpful, but as a technology professional, I am a mix of both. Mm. So as a technology professional, I would like Gen AI to do the housekeeping for data centers, for sure. I mean, we spend a lot of bandwidth there and all of my colleagues here on the panel will agree that we spend a lot of bandwidth there which could be deployed in innovation. So that okay. is wishful thinking from my side. Bring in more efficiency, take away these uh, sort of repetitive tasks and allow you to innovate. On that note, gentlemen, thank you very much. We've run out of time, but it's been a pleasure speaking with all of you, Ajay, Sundar, Sandeep, Girish. Thank you for your time, and thank you all for being a wonderful audience. Thank you. Put your hands together for Dinesh Karthik. It's a privilege to speak with someone who exemplifies the key traits that are vital, not just in sports, but also in technology and business, and that is resilience, agility, and leadership. And your journey has been nothing short of all of that. So let me just dive right in, uh, you know, and, and ask you, Dinesh, resilience is obviously very important in various fields of life, very much so in sports. And as the anchor was just saying, you know, you, you've seen high highs, whether you know, you're talking about the 2017 20 World Cup, the 2013 ICC Champions Trophy, and you've also come back from setbacks, uh, you know, very much like a pro. Is there a Dinesh Karthik way of sort of saying mentally strong and some lessons that you pass on to youngsters as a coach now as well? So, first of all, I'm a big believer in having one dream, one passion, and running after it. And what I mean by that is, uh, uh, the, in today's world, uh, the swipe culture is big, so people move on to things very, very quickly. I don't think a lot of the times people have the time to give energy to one thing. And I've seen that a lot with youngsters, where they'll start in a certain profession and they'll keep going. And then the moment the first heartbreak or hardship comes, they just want to jump ship. They feel the grass is greener on the other side. Whereas growing up, my only passion, Ritu, was to play for the country and, for, and to play one match. That's all I wanted to do. I got lucky. Played more than 300? I ended up doing that only because 
the whole feeling of representing the nation. I think when you have a single-minded focus on becoming the best at anything, then the passion that you have towards what you are doing is always the bigger goal. And for that, the smaller moments, the process as they call it, it's a very cliched term, but one that when I look back, I thought my process was always to become the best version slash cricketer. And that pushed me every day because, you know, I wasn't the most talented. When I started my journey, I played for the country for the first time. And within the first month, MS Dhoni came in. Now, he is the biggest thing to have happened in Indian cricket. Because I wanted to be the best cricketer, irrespective of whether it was an MS Dhoni there or whether it was Adam Gilchrist there, I wanted to carve my own niche. So I constantly prepared, MS Dhoni became the wicket keeper, I became the opening batsman. Gambhir came as opening batsman, I became the finisher. So I just found ways to be part of the team, but most importantly, the resilience that you speak about was one of my greatest strengths because I was always like water in a balloon. If you give one poke, I'll come out of that. You give another one, I'll come out of that. I found ways to get out and give the freedom to do whatever I could well. And that, I believe, is one of my strengths, to make the best use of whatever is available. Well, uh, you know, another thing that's very important in cricket, as it is in business, is team spirit. Uh, but you know, at the same time, that one winning catch or that last, uh, you know, sixer that really clinched the match is equally important. How do you balance that nurturing the team spirit within the team and also letting those stars also shine? The first thing when you sit as a group of people is identifying that every individual, as we sit here today, there's a room full of 300 people, every person is very different. Hmm. The next part comes understanding what the vision is. So you have to put a vision board. If you had to put a vision board, understanding what are the qualities you expect as a team, hmm. and then jotting that down, figuring out how do you imbibe those qualities. Now, in those qualities that we have earmarked, Certain people will possess certain qualities, but every person will lack in a quality or two. Now, how do, you, how do you get the team to understand what the vision is and how do they behave in day-to-day -day life to make sure whatever pointers we have given ourselves as a team to achieve that? The moment there is an honesty towards what we want to achieve as a team is done, the next part will be how do we live and breathe that during the time that we are together? One of the toughest aspects of IPL is the fact that it's a two-month tournament. You know, we play for about 60 days, but we only assemble 10 days before. If you play for India, if you play for your domestic team, you hang around for about 10 months of the year. So when you have longer time, then you're always able to build the team culture, as they call it. You're able to build a stronger vision and even if you falter at different places, you can always pick each other up to move in a direction that is meant to be. In IPL, because the time frame is so short, add to the fact that you have two West Indians, three New Zealanders and three Sri Lankans who are very different in personality and culture, to bring all of them together is the hardest task. And that's why you see Teams that have continued with the same set of players with very minimal changes, more often than not, achieve success for longer periods of time. And the teams which don't gel together always find it because they could have set a vision board. Everybody can sit in front of a board and write down what they feel like. But to live and breathe that every day is a task on its own. And that becomes very tedious if you don't gel well enough. And uh, I really wish that if the time frame is long enough and the vision is clear enough, definitely things will fall in place. Dinesh, thank you. What a wonderful conversation has been. There's so much to take away. Thank you for candidly answering all the business questions, all the cricket questions. I'm sure there are many, many more, but we appreciate your time here today. Thank you very much, Dinesh.